Hello. Welcome, everyone, to the All Things Data Track. I'm super stoked for the lineup we have today. Uh, my name's Ned. Uh, I'm one of the hosts of the specialist, uh, specialist track. Uh, we also have Ray and Pedro, who you'll see later on uh, throughout the day. They're down the front. Um, the only minor housekeeping thing I'm going to uh, mention before we jump straight in is that we have a Discord channel. Look for the Data Track uh, uh, Discord channel. Pop questions in there for when uh, folks are going to be taking questions if we have time. And just say hello, uh, chat. There's a hel big shout out to everyone in the online audience. Um, it's great that you're tuning in as well. So uh, with that said, let's jump into um, our proceedings. And uh, first up, we have Christine Seliger and Long Dang. Uh, Dan, they're going to be talking about uh, unpacking the geospatial engineering toolbox, an overview of data science techniques for spatial data. Just some quick intros. Uh, Christine is the technical lead of WSP Digital's data science and analytics team. A scientist by training, she has worked across a wide variety of different fields, from computer science and software engineering to biomedical research, fintech, and now civil engineering. She is continuously looking for new and interesting challenges to expand her knowledge and skills. Uh, Long is a junior data scientist, WSP, who likes all things math, deep learning, and computer science. Long is at most at home crunching through uh, some algorithm coding problems with too much scratch paper and a pen. When Long is uh, not at work, you can find Long watching anime, playing gacha games, going on random walks if the weather is nice, meeting friends and new people, or trying to get a neural network loss to go down. So uh, please, round of applause for our first talk. Yep. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for spending some of your time at the first talk for this track. Um, so I think when you think about data science, you probably think about statistical techniques, like the things that you can work on for tables, like the things you find in Excel. Or you may be thinking about unstructured data, like images and text, the things that you work with when using deep learning models like ChatGPT or stable diffusion. They're all cool and stuff, but at my workplace, WSB, we have a lot of contact with civil engineering disciplines. So one of the data types that we work a lot with is actually geospatial data. These are everywhere. They're very useful. And in this presentation, we would like to give you a brief overview of what geospatial data is, what you can use it for. We will give you some overviews of Python libraries and techniques that we use. Um, and we'll give you some examples of the actual use cases or projects that we deliver to clients and give them insights from their geospatial data. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. My name is Long, uh, and speaking today with me is Christine, and we are data scientists at the team. So the first question, it's probably the most important one, is what is geospatial data, and why is it important to us? So the long and short story is that geospatial data represents all the physical things that surround us. So it can represent the buildings, this building, this room, so the chairs, the roads around us. It can represent the electric lines that bring power into our homes, the water pipes that bring water and waste away from our homes. And Google Maps, as you can see to the right, is probably one of the best examples of how we use geospatial data in our everyday life. So we use all of this geospatial information about the layout of the buildings, of the cities, and the public transport network to help me get to this convention center today. Um, we also use it to find places to go to on the weekends, for example. And this is why geospatial data is important. We want to use all of this important information to make better decisions, not only how to move from place to place, but also how to build better cities, better environments, and better communities. So for example, we may want to use geospatial data to find the best place to build new social housing, new parks for underprivileged communities. We may want to understand how our infrastructure works, how they are all connected, where faults may happen, and if they do happen, where can we best solve them? Before we can delve into like, solving all these important problems, we first need to understand how we actually represent geospatial data for computers to understand. There are many ways that you can represent geospatial data, depending on whether you want to include verticality or not. But for this presentation, we'll mostly focus on the 2D case, so, you know, like a map where things live in two dimensions. In two dimensions, everything lives on a coordinate system, so they can be represented as vector data. And these are the intuitive things that you find in your everyday life, like shapes, lines, points. You can abstract over this representation using graphs where the shape of things no longer really mattered, 
only the connectivity of the objects you care about matter. Uh, 2D data also includes things like images and raster, where things are recorded in pixels. So for each pixel, it represents some actual real-life geographic area. And for that area, you measure some measurements, maybe the amount of rainfall, the amount of solar potential, and so on. So this is probably the simplest vector data that you can think of. It's just a triangle and a square. But you may be able to do more interesting to them when you start moving them around, uh, rotating them, finding the intersection between them, which is highlighted in purple here. You want to merge them, use one shape to mask the other shapes. So all of these are common operations that you may think of when we're dealing with vector data. And you can think of these representations as not unique to geospatial data alone, because they are shapes, they are practically everywhere, they're used a lot in computer graphics as well. So there are a lot of literature and algorithms that have been developed over the years that we can leverage for our geospatial data analysis. Speaking of tools and algorithms, at my team, we use a um, very common suite of tools to uh, extract insights from geospatial data. The favorites are QGIS, GeoPandas, Shapely, and NetworkX, which we will go over shortly. We also use Raster.io and LastPy, which are libraries for raster and LiDAR data, but we will not talk about it in this presentation because we don't have enough time. So the first stop is QGIS. This is where, when we receive data from a client or we download data from the internet, we will usually just plug them into this tool, and it will plot everything onto the map, and then we can scroll around just like on Google Maps. We can also click on the actual shapes itself to find attributes associated with that shape. So here, we are having a lot of polygons and orange shapes that are the footprints of houses, and we also have dots that represent um, points of interest. And QGIS also has a lot of tools associated with it. It's a full-power analytics tool, so it can also do all of that geometric operations that I talk about. It can merge things, find geometries of interest. As an open source tool, QGIS also has a lot of third-party plugins that you can use to improve your analytics workflow. And you can actually write Python scripts that can run in QGIS as well. If we have determined that QGIS is not sufficient for our work and we really want to dig deep into things and start automating things with code, the second stop is usually GeoPandas. It's kind of like Pandas, which is a library for manipulating tabular data, except we have an additional geometry column. And it can read and work with the most common geospatial data formats, like SHV or GeoJSON or GDB. So in this code snippet on the right, I'm importing GeoPandas and using the read file API to read all the geometries for suburbs in South Australia. And this read file API is very similar to the Pandas read CSV API. And you can pass arguments to it to specify which format you want to read it. And the next line of code to CIS is where the geometry column really shines. Here I'm using the 2CIS API to perform an operation that transforms one coordinate system to another. So when you think of coordinate system, you probably think of like latitude and longitude that can locate anywhere on the globe. But it's not the only coordinate system. And in fact, it's not even useful for some use cases where we want to measure precise distances in meters. You cannot really have a distance in degrees. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. So what we do is we convert that coordinate system into one that's locally precise for South Australia, where we can measure distances in meters. And so that's what we're doing with this API call. And then we can perform common pandas operations, so things that can work on tables, work similar here. Here I'm just indexing some columns and showing it in my Jupyter notebook. If we want to go a bit further and directly manipulate the geometry itself, we will turn to Shapley. Shapley actually underlies all of the GeoPandas geometries objects. So when I print the type of the first geometry in the geometry column, it actually comes out as Shapley.geometry.polygon. And I can also use a lot of the common geometry operations that Shapley provides. And here I'm trying to use the unary union operation. And th what this does is it just merges all of the geometries together. And because I'm merging the geometries of suburbs in South Australia, I expect to see well, the state of South Australia to emerge. Um, and it kind of does, except there's this big hole to the left, which I don't really know why. Maybe there's just no one living there. But um, as in old disciplines of data science, data quality is probably one of the biggest problems that we have. 
and geo geospatial data is no stranger to that problem as well. To really show how powerful these libraries are, though, we need to really dig into the use cases and the projects that we work with our clients to bring value to them. So the first project that we'd like to share with you is sewage pipe maintenance. So the, the problem that we're trying to solve for our clients here, which is a water utility company in New South Wales, is to optimize the sewage mains maintenance program to achieve the best performance for their budget. So the idea is sewage pipe, as they age, they get more prone to breakage or leakages, and it releases a lot of harmful things to the environment and also costs a ton to fix up. So ideally, we would like to replace or maintain the pipes before it gets too old. Um, obviously, you cannot really replace everything everywhere all at once, so you have to make decisions on which pipe to replace now within your budget. So for the scope of this work, we want to automate this optimiz opti um, optimization program, and we also want to add some new additional features. We want to tell the client how accessible a pipe is to maintenance equipment. And this kind of breaks down into two sub-measures. One is how much of a pipe is built over, say, by property. So you can see the pipe highlighted in red is kind of built over in certain places. The second dimension is how accessible a pipe is from the road behind like, all these properties. So let's say I want to access the red pipe from the road, then I may need to go over like, the building in gray. And that building may does not have a large enough driveway for my equipment to drive through. So for this problem, we have data that are the pipes and lines. We also have the outlines of all the buildings in these orange polygons. And these are actually generated from satellite images using the deep learning model. So that's an uh, interesting application there. And finally, we have some outlines of the lots for each property. And this data is publicly available from the New South Wales government. So to solve the first measure, which is how much of a pipe is built over, the algorithm is relatively simple. Um, intuitively, you can think of, well, if I want to find how much of a pipe is built over, I just find the exact section of pipe that is underneath any other geometry. And this is a um, geometry intersection problem. And in Shepley, you can do that with a single API call, the intersection API. So any geometry have an intersection method that can be called on a larger geometry. And then Shipley will handle the specific algorithms to intersect a line with a line, or a line with a polygon, et cetera. And it's all well and good. However, the problem of determining how much of the pipe is acceptable, accessible for an equipment behind properties is a bit harder. There's no really single unique operation that you can just do and get the answer. So our first naive approach is to try to measure the gap between the building and the lot fence line. So the idea is, well, if the pipe is in front of the property, then surely it's accessible. So that's the trivial case. If it's behind the property, then the issue is, is there like a big enough gap between the building and the lot fence line for the uh, equipment to drive straight in, like a driveway that's not blocked by a garage? So visually, we were trying to measure the distance of that red line between the building and the lot. And in Shepley, uh, distance is very easily performed, for assuming you are in that projected corner system that I mentioned earlier. You can use a distance API between any two geometries again. And Shepley will handle all the specifics to measure the shortest distance between any two points on those two geometries. This approach, however, kind of just breaks down when you add more complexity to the problem. So here I'm trying to add some extra like sheds and garage and maybe pools. So there's extra polygons now in the lot. And so this minimum distance between the building and the lot fence line doesn't really tell the whole story because maybe there's sufficient distance, but the shed further down the line is blocking, as you can see. Or maybe, so now you have to include the distance between the building and the shed as well. But if that distance is too small, maybe you also need to consider the first distance that we measured because there may still be a path straight through. So I guess you can come up with some algorithms to iterate over all these combinations of distances, but it's not a very naive algorithm anymore, and it's starting to be very complex and error-prone. Fortunately, there is a better approach which, takes, which uses uh, buffering. And buffering is just expanding or shrinking 
a geometry by a certain set distance. So in this illustration, we are buffering, expanding the original building geometries by one meter. So you can see the original geometries are in orange with the X cross on it, and the buffered outlines in a more transparent orange color. I'm also shrinking the original lot geometry by one meter, and the remaining space is colored in green. So the insight of this approach is that if we make some simplifying assumption on the shape of the equipment that we care about, and we're just going to assume that it's a sphere of some radius, and we can also t tweak this radius to actually account for the actual shape of the equipment, then the center of that sphere must lie in the green area. And you can kind of see this for yourself if you try to like, imagine placing the center of the sphere anywhere that is not in the green area then when you draw the sphere, it must intersect the last fence line on the original building geometry somewhere, because the radius would exceed the buffer distance. So if we now check if the green area contains both the pipe and access to the road, then surely some equipment that is a sphere would be able to go from the road to the pipe. We can now do this in Shapley using the difference and buffer API, which does exactly what it says it does. We compute the difference between the negatively buffered lot, so that's the, the shrinked lot, and the positively buffered buildings envelope to give the green area. We then iterate through each polygons within that green area, just in case that the buildings, when buffered, chops the area in half. And for each of that polygon, we can check if it intersects the road and the pipe geometries. If it does, then the pipe is accessible. The outcome of all of this algorithm is some condensed summarization measurements for each pipe that say how much of it's built over and how much of it is accessible. And all of these measurements can then be fed to downstream applications, for example, like in the dashboard or in some reporting program for the, so that the client can make decisions, or it can even be fed into another machine learning program to actually perform that optimization program in the first place. Sometimes, though, we don't really want to have this summarization measurements from a geospatial data. We instead want some geospatial data as outputs from our initial geospatial data, because we may want to, for example, visualize them on the map. And the second project I want to share with you is one where this is the case. In this project, heavy vehicle road access. Um, sorry. The, the problem is we want to evaluate road networks in New South Wales against electric trucks' dimensions. So the idea is, the state of New South Wales wants to adopt electric trucks, but they are really large compared to original trucks. They are larger and longer to account for their batteries. And you have ever driven behind trucks, you know that you don't want to be inside this turning curve, because as it turns, it creates this really large swept path, which is this total area that it traces out as it turns. And you don't want to be inside it, because then it's going to hit you, and that's not going to be a fun experience. So the client wants to understand if the road network in New South Wales is sufficient for all of its new vehicles. So for that purpose, we... Yep, sorry. I think my laptop is not uh, liking me today. Yep. <laughs> yep, so we have developed a simple algorithm that can simulate the swept path given the, the path that the, the mover of the vehicle takes. But this is actually the start of a new problem, because this simulation algorithm needs the path that the mover takes, but the data that we were given actually do not have any information on what actual path it can take to turn. So the information we are given is a single line for each road geometry that starts and ends where the road starts and ends. So in this intersection, we have many separate roads, but we have no information that tells the algorithm it, that it can turn. Uh, sorry. That it can take road one, two, and three to turn right from the top. So none of that information is available to the algorithm itself. All it sees is this separate collections of roads. So we need a way to, given this collection of roads, enumerates the possible paths that the truck can take, and then output some actual road geometry that 
the truck can, the simulation algorithm that can then take. Yeah, sorry for that. Bye. Yep, it's just, yeah. Um, so the way that we solved it is by using a network X library, which constructs graph. OK, so let's see if I can get this to work now. So what we did is we take each individual road and turn it. <laughs> Just go to the last yeah. and don't click. We take each individual road and compute and treat it as an abstract edge. So the start and end of the road will be the start and end vertex in the graph. And we ignore all the actual coordinates that link those two vertex together. Then if we define some start and entrance vertices to the graph, to the intersection, so maybe we can use, if there's only one edge to the node, then that is an entrance on the exit vertex. Then we can use a graph algorithm to kind of find the shortest path between those two vertex, and that will give us a list of edges in this graph. And then we can extract the coordinates of the road that is associated with the edge, and then concatenate them, and that will form the final road the truck can take. So, When in, in Networks X, this is done using the code in the bottom right. So we first initialize this graph component, this graph class, then we iterate through each road geometries, and then we can index into the coordinates array and find the first and final coordinate and treat it as start and end vertex. Network X actually allows you to input any hashable, immutable Python data structure to be the vertex, so you can just in insert the coordinates pair right into it. And we can also attach the coordinates of the original live stream geometry as well. And this make it easy, makes it easier to just extract the coordinates and then concatenate all the, 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 the paths together. We can then smooth out this path using some additional NumPy geometries, NumPy vectors, and some math to create this red geometry that informs the simulation algorithm that the truck can now take this path to turn right. And we can do the same for every other pairs of start and end vertices, vertex. And that helps create all this path that navigate this intersection. Now, if I click next, it will jump all the way again. So <laughs> I will just present without any <laughs> visual aid before passing it on to Christine. Um, so the output of this algorithm would be this swap path geometry that we have simulated for the truck. And then we can kind of look into the widths along the swept path. And then we look at the width of the road. And then we say, oh, at this location, the width of the swept path is too large. And so there will be a problem, because this truck will now go into the opposite lane and cause problems for other vehicles. Or it may intersect some roadside geometric assets, like maybe fence or traffic lights, I don't know. The problem is we don't really have very good labels on how wide a road is at any point. It would be good if we have the actual geometries for the road, like a polygon that covers the area of the road. But that is actually quite hard to get. So as in all other data science problems, truthy label is also a problem in our case, where we don't have the truthy geometry labels that we can compare the swept path simulation with. So with that said, I will now pass it on to Christine, who will take it over from here. So I yep, and it's to move to the <laughs> next slide. <laughs> yeah, so with this last use case, um, we are pushing the libraries and tools that Long was talking about a little bit to the side. They're not the center stage of it, but they are still very important to produce inputs and outputs for our anal analysis. Our team frequently supports um, traffic modeling simulation task with data analytics um, and automation. And occasionally, the tools and frameworks that are in use by those teams are necessarily suitable for, for the problem at hand. And in this case, one of the issues they encountered was modeling reversal of vehicles. So what was the problem? Um, we were asked to look at a precinct in a mountainous region that gets frequented, particularly on weekends, by a lot of tourists. And this precinct is to access roads um, that are very narrow and in a lot of places um, they're just single file. So you can imagine if you're driving down that road 
with a lot of traffic, you're encountering other vehicles going the other direction quite frequently, which causes you to either try to be brave and scramble past them, or what is probably a little bit safer um, is to reverse and find a spot where you can safely let them pass. The operators of this road were particularly worried about like the latter, people reversing up and down the road and creating too much traffic on it, so they asked us to provide some foundations to intuitive um, traffic operations that they could use to alleviate that problem. For example, using shuttle buses to get the vast majority of people down that road with different schedules and different sizes, or to implement boom gate solutions on either end of the road. Um, so, how did we approach this problem? We needed something that could iterate over a lot of different situations fairly quickly, and um, we decided to break the road up into cells. And each of these cells would have properties, such as whether they are single or double file, and, for example, the speed associated with traveling on this particular location, um, and it would have a state, which um, represents a vehicle being on the cell, whether this vehicle is traveling east or west, um, or whether it is currently reversing or in a holding state waiting for a vehicle to pass. Um, for each time step in the simulation, the cells would update their state in a random order based on the surrounding cells, and we introduced some more variability, for example, the arrival times of cars at either end of that road, um, based on distributions we got from traffic counts that were actually measured up front. What, allows us, what this allows us to do is very quickly test different operating scenarios, introduce the boom gates um, and buses and other things, and simulate thousands of typical days um, how traffic could evolve on this road. How did we implement this? At the core of this is a custom simulation that we wrote in Python, and one of the key inputs to this is a shapefile that contains the geometry of the road. And you can imagine that you can easily load it and then use Shapely, that Long was talking about before, to break this road down into evenly sized segments. In addition, we put the vehicle counts in and a config file that then relates the change along that road and therefore its relation to the cells with regards to what the speed limits are on, or the average speeds on those sections of road and which ones are the single file locations. Now, once you've done that, your simulation can essentially forget about the spatial context of this. However, it's really valuable to keep this information in the back of your head, because what we did is we implemented a visualization in Pygame for this, which is basically translating the coordinates of the cells into screen coordinates, and we could use this to take the client on our journey of develop developing the simulation and show them along the way <coughs> how vehicles are actually moving along their Bendy Mountain Road. Then the simulation has a batch mode where you can run thousands of simulation and it's just chucking out files with the parameters that we are interested in. So the last bit to this analysis that is missing is what do we do with all this data once the simulation is produced it? And in good old data science style, we developed a Python notebook that reads all of this in for a single scenario and then creates um, aggregated outputs. And again, the spatial representation of these cells becomes really quite important because it allows us to produce a spatial representation of our results that then can be loaded, for example, in QJS and put on maps to show people the actual content of what's happening. And these are some example outputs. I need to say that the y-axis went missing <laughs> from these plots, <laughs> but it's the percentage of vehicles, and it, for example, shows the travel time overall on the road, the intergate travel time, the number of interactions that vehicles have, and on the left and the top right, in particular on the left, you can see the hotspots of these reversal interactions that um, we were mostly interested in. And on the right, you can see general vehicle interactions, which also includes vehicles holding or queuing up behind others. Now, this approach really worked quite well, and after this, we conducted a second study um, with a very different topic, but the same methodology, which basically looked at a mine site in WA and the road that is required to access it. And this is a dirt road, and the biggest problem there is dust development. So we basically use this methodology to simulate different operating scenarios for water trucks, convoy scenarios to get workers in and out, and um, heavy vehicles traveling um, up and down this road in machinery. Um, yeah, so a very useful little methodology, and as you can see, the spatial context is really important and useful to show your results. Um, that's it from us. If there are still 
time. I think happy to take questions. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Thank you so. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, we are running a bit late, and so um, you did a wonderful job with a few min minutes extra, but we might give that back to folks too, because we're going to try and stick to the uh, 11 o'clock schedule. So uh, we'll jump into saying thank you so much, Christine and, and Long, um, and we have some, some gifts for you. Oh, how awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um,